Hello, this is Tom from anti-proton.com. I just completed an exciting experiment. I wanted to show you the results of it. So let me quickly tell you about the experiment. Then I'll show you videos of the setup and everything. And I'll also show you the results of the experiment at the end. Let me try to be a little quicker than I usually am because I take forever normally in my videos. All right, the experiment was simple. An antimatter reactor in my house, sort of. Well, at least that's what I wanted to do. And the second part of the experiment was a transmutation of aluminum, stable aluminum 27. Aluminum 27, by the way, is stable aluminum, like what you all are used to dealing with. And I was transmuting it into radioactive phosphorus 30, which is a really short-lived exotic sort of isotope of phosphorus that's not around very commonly because, well, only lasts for a few minutes. One and a half normally is its half-life. So anyway, let me get into the quick part of the experiment and I'll show you everything. First off, I took... Um, a commercially available polonium-210 source at 3,700 becquerels. That's one-tenth of a microcurie. It's about one-ninth of what's in your smoke alarm, except your smoke alarm is americium-241, not polonium-210, but you get the point. It's a small amount. I've had it for a while now, 253 days when I did the experiment, so I had to do a little bit of math, you know, e to the negative uh, natural logarithm 2 divided by the half-life, multiplied by the amount of time I've had it, and I came up with about a thousand becquerels, give or take, so it's, the source has gotten kind of weak, so I was kind of thinking to myself, how can I do this experiment with such a weak source? The only person I've seen successfully do it used 400,000 times what I used. Or maybe it was 200,000 times. It was a hell of a lot. So basically put I figured to myself, distance inverse square, right? If I have a nuclear source, and I'm standing here, well here, and I take a certain amount of dose, if I double that distance, I quadru I, well, I divide by four the amount of, uh, you know, energy I've taken, because it expands every direction, so as you move away, it's like dissipating massively and, and, and exponentially. But the inverse is also true. If I get this close to the source, I can make a little bit of phosphorus 30. But if I get this close to the source, I can make a lot of phosphorus 30. How do I do that? Microscope. At 40x, which is the lowest possible setting of this microscope, I was able to take about a millimeter square of aluminum and place it with how, how close? Perhaps maybe a few one hundredths of a micrometer's distance from the polonium 210. Yeah. Manipulating that was difficult. Horrifyingly difficult. I had gloves on, sweat dripping down my face, goggles, the whole nine yards. But anyhow, it was rewarding. I ran it for 12 hours. Now let me tell you one little thing that's important to know about this whole test before I show you the details of it. The result of the um, alpha particles slamming into the aluminum. When the alpha particle comes out of polonium-210, it has an energy of about 5 million electron volts. It's 5,304.1 or 0.2, something like that. So about 5 million electron volts when it slams into that aluminum. Three, three of the four parts of that, of that um, alpha particle will stick to that aluminum. You see, an alpha particle is made of two protons and two neutrons. It's four particles. And if you know anything about a little bit of science, you might know that that sounds a hell of a lot like a, like a helium nucleus. That's because it is. When you fill a balloon for a party, that's just helium. Same thing. If you ripped off all the electrons, you'd have alpha particles. Well, you'd have to give them a lot of energy, too. But you get the point. So when those atoms, I mean, when those alpha particles slam into the, into the um, aluminum, they have a lot of energy, and they transfer that. One of the particles doesn't quite fit, uh, quantum mechanically speaking, it is a neutron which goes flying off and zooming off. And that neutron carries with it a hell of a lot of energy. And in fact, let me tell you how much energy. I did the math to try to figure out how much energy, and I used an equation that was given to me by a kind of a really, really awesome uh, uh, physicist. Cool guy, has got a great book, I will not name drop, but you know who you are if you're watching this, and you're probably writing me a message right now telling me how poorly of a job I did with my experiment. But that's okay. Anyhow, because you're still cool. Um, basically put, uh, using the equation he gave me, I came up with 5.131382 million electron volts for the neutron. He did the same thing, but better because he's an actual physicist. He came up with 2.574 MeV. So which one of us is right? I don't know. Actually, neither did he, but I'm going to say he's probably right. He's a physicist. I'm not. But... Um, 
I'll show you the math. Look at my details section. The math is right there. Take a look at it for yourself. See where it may be wrong. That's a lot of energy. And I used water jugs and everything to stop the neutrons. And then I had secondary shielding around them to catch the Bromstrahlung that comes from the stopping of the neutrons and all this other business that got out of hand. I don't like neutron flux very much. Um, the other problem is that when the uh, aluminum turns into phosphorus, it decays into silicon. Silicon, uh, I don't remember which one, what's it turn into? Silicon 30? Yeah, silicon 30, right? I think so. I think it turns into silicon 30 off the top of my head. I have it written down someplace. But when it does, it does so by emitting a positron, which is an anti-electron, it's anti-matter. Now, electrons floating around in my room slam into that phosphorus, or not phosphorus, into that um, positron and annihilate to produce 1,022 kiloelectron volts of energy, an annihilation, pure, beautiful annihilation energy. And that shoots two different gamma rays, each one at 511 keV energy, it's kiloelectron volts. And they slam into my, um, into my gamma spectrometer detector and I detect them. And they build up. Now they're naturally there too. So what I did was I built them up with my, my uh, technique and then I ran with, with just my polonium source and no aluminum and built them up again, and I subtracted the two, and the net difference is the ones that I made. Those are mine. Those are Tom brand positrons. I've done this test four or five times, and each time I do it, I get a little tiny bit more positrons from when I do it than when I do it without my stuff. So it's so close, it's hard to tell. I can't, t I, I want to celebrate. I want to celebrate. If nothing more, I'd like to celebrate that it was a good experiment. I'm, I, I'm sure that I made them. I'm pretty sure just by looking at the data. But I'm barely one standard deviation from the norm, barely. So it's too close for me to officially call it. But between you and I and the wall, I made antimatter. So anyhow, um, without further ado, here is the video of me putting the aluminum on the polonium-210. Alright, now here is the Annihilation Peak. You might notice the fact that it's made in blue, and it does, it's not really that much higher than a lot of the other stuff, but it's kind of condensed and right up there. This is after I removed the background that also had polonium in it, so this is like the official one. This is my best result so far. It's not too bad, not too bad. We're looking at 40, 50 counts somewhere in there, right down that center channel. Alright, now this one right here, this next picture, is um, the polonium background minus a normal background to see if it looked a little different. And if you'll notice, it's kind of flat and wide because not too much extra was made. Now this final one is me doing the same thing again, making my my antimatter, but then subtracting it with a regular background without the polonium sample, and yet again you'll see another powerful peak. But that tells you something. It tells you that the polonium itself is somehow contributing around the 511 keV range, probably doing some crazy stuff. So anyhow, that um, that's what I found. Now here are the videos showing exactly what happened.
I think that this calls for a celebration. And nothing helps you celebrate better than ethanol. So, <clears throat> without further ado, I'm going to pour myself a little bit of a Sovereign Cabernet Sauvignon. And this is a 2010, so it's not really a good vintage. It's only two years. I usually like to go with a um, slightly better bottle. A Chapelet Cabernet Sauvignon 2002 is what I'd recommend. But unfortunately, at like $60 a bottle or something like that, I usually don't buy one of those too often. But anyhow, this has been Tom from anti-proton.com, and no, you can't do this with a Geiger counter. Cheers!